sometimes we may think that a successful relationship depends on not getting into fights. But it's not that. Conflict, quarrel, arguments, also anger, are not the core problem that breaks relationships. What breaks relationships is when arguments don't get resolved, when they pile up, when contempt builds and partners withdraw from each other. In this video, you will learn how not to and how to communicate in conflict situations so that they can be something that brings you closer to your loved one instead of driving a wedge between the two of you. Hey everyone, I'm Micah, a psychologist, and this is Becoming an Expert at Self-Leadership. And this video is about how we lead ourselves through a conflict situation with a loved one so that the conflict can get resolved and the other person, the relationship, and we ourselves can thrive. John Gottman, a retired researcher and psychology professor, dedicated his entire career to figuring out what makes relationships work. And based on his studies and observations, he's now able, and I'm sure also anyone that he trains is able, to predict with 91% accuracy whether a couple will stay together or break up based on listening to them talk to each other for 15 minutes. And what I want to share with you from his research in this video are four behaviors that he's observed that are big red flags when they come up in conflict situations. Number one, overgeneralized criticisms. We sometimes need to address things that are upsetting us in relationships, but what's important is that we do that and only that. What often happens is that we don't just stick with the one behavior and situation that's upsetting to us in that moment, but we overgeneralize and criticize the whole character of our partner. So instead of saying, I'm angry that you didn't unload the dishwasher last night like we had agreed on. Could you please do it as soon as possible? We may say something like, you're such a lazy slob. What is wrong with you? Why can't you do such a simple thing? Overgeneralized criticism often contains words like always, never, and it's focused on the other person's personality and character. It's unnecessarily hurtful to the other person and it blows problems way out of proportion. An effective criticism, on the other hand, contains information about the specifics of the situation, what you observed, what you noticed, what you're addressing, about the consequences of that for the family, for you, for the situation, also for your emotions, how you're feeling now, and information about your need and request to the other person. So instead of, I'm not important to you, you're a bad spouse, this sounds like you just mentioned that you've made plans with your friends on the weekend and considering everything else that's going on, this means that we won't have quality time for each other, which makes me kind of sad. I'd like for us to schedule time for just the two of us next week. Number two, contempt. Contempt is fueled by chronic negative thoughts about our partner, which in turn are fueled when conflicts don't get resolved. Contempt is when someone signals that they are repulsed and disgusted by their partner. It's when someone thinks and expresses that they are better than their partner, that they're perhaps too good for them when they're taking the moral high ground. Contempt is expressed verbally and non-verbally. Non-verbally, it can be sneering with an aggressive undertone or eye rolling. And verbally, it's when the things we say aim only at pointing out how deficient the other person is and at demeaning them, not at resolving the conflict. It's a form of disrespect. It's so important not to get careless with our loved ones, not to allow our ego and self-righteousness to get out of hand, to respect them just like we respect other people and keep the same tone with them, maybe even a more loving one. 
It can help to ask ourselves, would I be talking to someone else the same way right now? What if my partner were a guest at our house right now? So check your ego, be respectful, cultivate positive thoughts and express appreciation in, instead of contempt. Number three, defensiveness. Defensiveness is when we're making the point that it wasn't me, I did everything right. By logic, this sends the message that it's you, you're the problem. It's the mentality of, I'm just the innocent victim here, you are the culprit. This does not contribute to reconciliation, but adds extra drive to the conflict. After one person said something defensive, it's not likely that the other person will suddenly start listening attentively, suddenly understand, offer a solution or apology. The problem with defensiveness is not that we're holding a boundary, and it's also not equal to that, actually. The problem is that it turns our attention away from the solution to the problem. So it's a problem focus instead of a solution focus. So the antidote that I see to defensiveness is to stay focused on finding the solution. Number four, stonewalling. This last one usually only develops after a couple of years in a relationship. It's when one partner shuts down in the middle of a conflict situation or they don't even want to get into it. When they block the other person out and avoid getting into the conflict. So they're avoiding the conflict and in that way also ultimately the relationship. It's when there's been so much unresolved fighting that the only solution this person sees is to disengage from the conflict and the relationship. Stonewalling is mostly nonverbal since the person has stopped speaking. When someone is stonewalling, it seems like they couldn't care less about what the other person is saying. They just kind of sit there stiff like a wall and avoid eye contact. But it could also be that they start doing something else, like turn on the TV, open a newspaper, walk out of the room, Stonewalling can be more or less intentional. So it's helpful not to assume that someone is doing this intentionally or even out of malintent. It could very well be that they're just emotionally overwhelmed and looking for a way to calm down. Because in these types of situations, the brain isn't functioning the way it needs to for a constructive discussion and structured and clear thoughts. It all really just depends on the person's general attitude towards engaging with their partner, conflict and all. The difference to the silent treatment I see is that stonewalling aims at shutting down discussions and avoiding conflict. Whereas when someone gives someone else the silent treatment, they usually want to turn that person's attention onto something and prompt change there. They want to draw a boundary, but they can't find a way of expressing that with words. Whether someone is stonewalling or protesting through the silent treatment, these behaviors do not resolve conflict. And when it comes to stonewalling, Gottman's suggested antidote is to take a break during a heated argument. Everyone does their own thing, calms down, and it really needs to be about calming down, not about preparing for the next round and wallowing in all the negative things the partner said to really calm down, then get back to it, maybe even on another day. But then proceed without global criticism, contempt, and defensiveness, because then stonewalling won't even be necessary. I think there's a lot of wisdom in these four behaviors John Gottman observed in conflicts that fuel conflicts and that it's really helpful to know them so that we can recognize when we slide into them and then switch into a solution-focused, effective, and more loving way of communicating. Our loved ones are amongst the most precious gifts of life. Let's treat them with the love and kindness that they need and also deserve.
Thanks for sticking around till now. I'm so glad that you're here. Remember to subscribe if you're new here. Till next time, take care. And remember that reconciliation starts with effective criticism, which is specific, respectful, and solution-focused, not generalized, demeaning, and problem-focused. <laughs>